Are you wanting God's favor but not seeing it in your life? Or maybe you have seen some favor but you want more. Today I want to unpack some things that Nehemiah did in his life to get him the favor from God and favor from the king. What I really want to talk about right now is what favor Nehemiah got. I want us to understand what he got and then I want to unpack how he got it. Because I think sometimes we see favor in people's life and we say this, wow, God really favored them. Wow, this person really favored them. But we don't unpack how they got there. We don't kind of look at the behind the scenes journey. And what I think is really cool about the first couple chapters of Nehemiah is that they really unpack how he got to where he was. Now, one of the things Nehemiah got from the king is he got time off, okay? He got time to build. Sometimes favor from an employer looks like you getting a bunch of time off. You know, there was a time in my life, God told me and Ryan to go to Guatemala for an entire month on missions. And I was like, I don't even know how this is gonna work. And Ryan's boss gave him an entire month off of work. And somehow it ended up three weeks of it were paid and one week wasn't. But that was favor. What boss would say you can leave for a month, okay? But God was sending us on a missions trip and he knew. So Ryan received favor from his boss that moment. And it was the same thing as Nehemiah. Nehemiah comes to this point in his life where his walls were broken down, Jesus. The walls that were important to him were broken down. The gates were ablaze in fire. And I believe that some of you right now are feeling like your walls are broken down. I believe some of you right now are feeling like your gates are on fire. And so Nehemiah is in this situation where he sees the people that he loves and the area that he loves be basically demolished by the enemy. And in these moments, we really need God to come because we need him to rebuild our lives and change our lives. And so Nehemiah gets before the king and the king gives him time off. He was the king's cupbearer and the king basically says to him this. He says, okay, how much time do you need to go do what you need to do? And he tells him and he says, okay. Imagine telling your employer saying, this is the amount of time I want off and them just saying yes. And sometimes for those of you that are like myself, you don't work for anybody except the Lord. You know, you have your own ministry, you have your own business, you don't have an employer. You know, sometimes that could be just having the time to go on a vacation and somehow miraculously for all of us that own a business or a ministry, you know that it's not always easy because you know that you always kind of have to be doing things to make sure the business and ministry are still running correctly behind the scenes. And so you don't always fully get time off, but what if you could? What if God favored you in such a way that you could fairly find people that you trust to take some time off? So he got time off, Jesus. Mm. Now the next thing he got is he got the materials to build. Imagine saying to your employer, not only do I want time off, but uh, hey, can you fund what I want to do? That's what happened to Nehemiah. But I believe that, you know, he asked for it. He said, okay, you know, he said, what do you need to do this? And he told him all the materials that he needs. So he got all the lumber that he needed in order to rebuild. Jesus, mm, mm. I just heard the Holy Spirit say the lumber is coming, Jesus, mm. Now the third thing that Nehemiah got, and I think this is one of the coolest things actually, is Nehemiah got access, Jesus. Nehemiah got the king to write him all these letters, so wherever he needed to go and whatever he needed to do, he had the king's approval. You know, when you get favor from the king, it gives you access. Come on, when you get favor from the king, it gives you access, Jesus. Favor can get you access. Sometimes, the favor is not stuff. Sometimes the favor is not time oriented or money oriented. Sometimes certain favor is access. You know, um, there are certain conferences that you can't even go to unless you are part of a certain group or something like that. You know, it's like you have to get access. You have to be access granted, you know. Um, and not everything in this life is money. I think once you get a certain amount of money, you'll realize that not everything, or not every door that opens money. Even though Solomon said that, and it's somewhat true, sometimes spiritual things, societal things, um, 
whatever are not allowing the door to open and the Holy Spirit has to come in and give you access. And that's part of what's included in favor. Favor can give you access, Jesus. Mm. Now, what I want to do is I want to kind of expose in a good way um, what Nehemiah did behind the scenes to get this favor. Because here's a cupbearer being given all this time off, being given all this lumber to go rebuild an area that was precious to him. And But I think it just didn't happen by happenstance. I believe that Nehemiah did a lot of things behind the scenes in order to have these doors open to him. And I want to encourage you, sometimes favor costs you something. Sometimes favor requires you to do something. Sometimes I think we preach and you're going to get the favor of God. And sometimes that's just true. Sometimes God just does things because he loves you. Okay, so I'm not listening that. I've seen God do things for me and I'm like, why did he even do that for me? It was just because he loved me. There is other times where you're going to have to go before the Lord to get his favor to move on your behalf. Now let's go into 10 things that Nehemiah did in order for us to use those same principles in order to get favor from God. Okay, some things, it's not only prayer. Okay, sometimes there's other things. Jesus, somebody needs to hear this right now. Not every door opens from only prayer. Sometimes doors open in other ways as well. And sometimes you couple them with prayer. Jesus. Number one, Nehemiah identified what happened and what was going on. He was not in denial about what happened. He was not ignoring what happened. He pressed into it. He really embraced the moment. He knew what was going on and he embraced it. I think so many times we don't have certain breakthroughs in our lives because we are lying to ourselves. We are in denial what is happening. And because we are in denial of what is happening, we don't have the proper breakthroughs that we want because we're not even real about what's going on. Some of you, you're not fine and it's okay that you're not fine. You know, I think we live in this plastic church, okay? So many times we live in a plastic church where it's like everyone's got to look perfect. Everyone's got to look real. And it's even in the spirit led church. It's not just the denominational churches, okay? I think sometimes we're like, oh, we're spirit-led. Like, we're so much better than them. Sometimes we're not. Sometimes we are totally not. Because, you know, the character is still not right. The problems are still not right. People are still throwing stuff and cursing you out. And just like, sometimes it is still just as bad, okay? And, you know, honestly, I feel like I saw the most transparent, honest, real people um, live when I was a part of um recovery group in a non spirit filled church, okay, and it was a non denominational church, and these people were just real. They were just raw. They were just humble. They were just honest. They were talking about what they're really going through. They were talking about their real weaknesses, their real struggle, and I just honestly found that so refreshing. And I think sometimes the spirit filled church, the spirit led church, does not have breakthrough because they fake. You know, I think they're all like, they're acting like they're walking in faith, but they're actually walking in fake. There's a difference between faith and fake, okay? And a mature believer is going to be able to identify the difference between fake and faith. Faith is not ignoring where you are. Faith is believing God for more. You don't have to ignore, I'm not here, I'm not here. Well, you living in denial is not helping anybody get anywhere, okay? Because you might not be dealing with the problems on this level that you need to deal with, Jesus. So step number one to getting a favor is really identifying where you are and what is going on. Stop lying to yourself. Stop letting people lie to you, gaslight you, manipulate you to make you think something else is going on. Really know what's going on in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Mm. All right, number two, mourn for as long as necessary. Now, some of you are gonna just ignore this step completely because let's be real, mourning is not fun. It's easier to sit on the couch and eat some Cheetos and watch a show that you like on Netflix and chill than it is for you to really deal with your problems. And some of you, it's not sitting on Netflix. It might be going out with your girlfriends, drinking. It might be shopping. It might be gossiping. 
because all those things distract your mind from what's really going on. But these distractions, these addictions that you've created are allowing you not to mourn something that God needs you to mourn so you can actually get healed. There's healing in the morning, Jesus. There's healing in the morning. I'm telling you right now, the amount of things I've cried about is absolutely ridiculous. I'm sure it's thousands of things. But I allow myself to be cleansed of all my feelings so I can be empty so God can really fill me up with what needs to be there. You not mourning a situation is not good, okay? And I don't like mourning. I'm not like one of those people, yes, I enjoy crying and I just want to sit over here and cry all the time. I don't. But I realize that mourning keeps my heart soft, okay? So when I feel pain, I can cry it out. You know, when I, you know, do something I really didn't want to do, I can cry and mourn before the Lord if I need to. Whatever I need to do, just getting it all out of my heart because my heart being soft allows me to be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Why can I speak at conferences and prophesy over everyone in the entire room and be accurate? It is because I allow my heart to be soft, okay? Having a soft heart is so important, Jesus. But it's not just for the prophetic, it's also for breakthrough because again, you don't even know what's going on inside of you. You have all this built up stuff and so you're not getting the breakthrough because you ain't even dealing with what's going on inside of you, okay? So number one, identify what happened. Number two, mourn for as long as necessary. If you lost someone, you need to mourn that. You can't just ignore it and stay busy. I always hear people say this, just stay busy. No, don't stay busy. Feel it, deal with it. How many times in the Old Testament do we see that people are mourning? They're mourning for days. They're mourning for a month. They're just getting every feeling of pain out of them. Now, how do you know if you've gone from mourning to depression? Because there is a difference there. Mourning has an expiration date. Mourning ends at some point, okay? Depression goes on and on and on and goes in circles. Now, what will happen is when you're done mourning, you'll feel a peace from the Holy Spirit arise. When that peace arises, the mourning has come out of you and you have completed your mourning season, okay? So unlike the Old Testament, which is very structured, there was times for mourning and stuff like that. Ours is more relational where the Holy Spirit will arise peace in our hearts again when the mourning needs to be completed, Jesus. And sometimes on the other side, there will be joy, there will be happiness because everything is out of you, Jesus. Mm. Number three, Nehemiah fasted before the Lord. Now, this is a really good one. Um, and what I said here was fasted before the Lord. Don't be fasting to lose weight and think that's a fast breakthrough. Maybe it is for you to lose weight, but that's a health fast. That's not a spiritual fast, okay? Now, I think you need to ask the Holy Ghost how you need to fast. Now, some of you, this is gonna be different. It's okay to fast a certain food. You know, maybe there's a certain food. I've pulled certain foods out of my life before for like a certain period of time. You know, there was, and as I pull it out of my life, say for 30 days or something like that, or two weeks or something, it's like I'll feel something behind that. Like, ooh, I think I was using that food in an, in an unhealthy way because there was something hidden under that in my heart that has arose from me letting go of that food. And so fasting also often reveals what's already there. Um, and, you know, yes, we all get hangry, but I, I believe there's sometimes even more than that. You'll start seeing things in your heart come up um, and you need to deal with that when you're fasting. But as we fast before the Lord, again, it makes us more sensitive to the Holy Spirit and it humbles us. You know, it's hard to be super puffed up when you're just relying on the Lord to survive. But from this place of humility before the Lord, I often think that there's a lot of breakthrough there. And so I always say, people will be like, what kind of fast should I do? And I always have a very simple answer to that. And it's the fast that the Holy Spirit has told you to do. I don't personally think doing a certain this kind of fast over this kind of fast is more holy than the other because everyone's in different seasons of life and everyone's body is different and everyone's health is different and everyone's addictions are different. And so doing the fast that the Holy Spirit has prompted is going to be that fast that opens doors for you specifically, Jesus. Mm. All right, number four, pray and pray daily, Jesus. 
The Bible says that Nehemiah prayed daily over the situation. This was not something he prayed about one time. He continued to pray over this. And I think in our culture, it's important to go from this place of hoping to praying. Because as we pray daily or consistently over something, God reveals to us more and more about the situation. I don't know how many times I've been in prayer over the same situation and God will have me look at it a little bit different way that time in prayer, or God will give me one more step to go towards it. And so it's those little things that you get in prayer um, when you consistently pray over something that are needed for especially big breakthroughs. I'm not talking about like you lay hands on someone and they're healed instantly. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like you need this huge door to open. You need this abusive situation to stop. You need a new relationship, you know, something that you can't just lay hands on and it's fixed, like not that kind of thing, you know, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't pray daily over healing or something. I believe you can do that, of course, but I believe a lot of that stuff can just happen instantly because that's part of like being God's child. That's our bread, you know, but at the same time, there's some things and, and certain healings too, where you, you have to pray over it every day and God will give you a little bit of information. You know, and sometimes it's not the information we want. You know, sometimes you'll be having a stomach ache for three months and God's like, you need to stop eating this thing. It wasn't someone laying hands on you. It was don't eat this food anymore. I know, and you might not like that answer, but sometimes that's just the answer he gave to Jesus. So I think we should consistently pray over things. I also think another thing praying over things daily or consistently does is it shows us what demons and principalities are blocking that breakthrough. And so I know that there's a lot of people that believe, well, once you prayed for it to pray again is not faith. Well, then why did Nehemiah pray daily over this situation? Hmm. I don't believe that. I believe that you can have faith with and continue to pray for more information regarding the situation. So some of you get back in the prayer closet. You didn't pray about it enough. Okay. Because as you continue to do, it starts to shake a little bit. You start to get some of the pieces of the puzzle. Jesus. Hmm. All right, number five, exalt God, okay? Um, Nehemiah exalted the Lord. He magnified his name. Jesus, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. God, we exalt you, Lord. We just pray that our situation change. We have situations, Lord, that only you can change. There's things in our lives that there's no way in our flesh that we could change them, God. There's no way that we could move this mountain in our flesh, God, but only you can move it. We just magnify your name because you are the God that moves. You are the God that changes. You are the God of more than enough. You are the God that's going to get us out of this situation, God. You are the God that's moving us right now. You're moving. I keep hearing the word moving. You're moving us right now. As we exalt the Lord, we get in more faith, we get in his presence, and both of those things can change things. So we see Nehemiah exalt the Lord, and I think that's a key to favor as well. Because, you know, think about it in the natural. If God was just a random person, which he's not, but you know what I mean? It's like, if there was a random person and you're like, man, you're so awesome and you're so great and whatever, and the other person over there is like, I hate you, I can't believe you're doing this. Who are you going to help? You're going to help the person who's telling you you're awesome and amazing. You're not going to help the person who's telling you you're horrible and I hate you. And so some of you need to stop telling God you hate him. Stop like stop being angry at God over situations. Be at peace, okay? And I think God can handle our anger, but we can't stay there, okay? There's times where I've told God I'm really angry at him over certain something that's happened in my life. Um, I've had situations where I'm just like, I really don't understand why you did that. Like, I'm really angry about it or you didn't show up or something like that. It felt like you didn't show up even if you did in a way I don't understand. And I've told him that I was angry, but I can't stay there. I can't stay in that place constantly. Okay. Um, so you have to move on to the next place. Jesus. Mm. Number six, Nehemiah had good character. Kind of. We'll get into this in a minute. But let's just say for the sake of this, Nehemiah had good character. It says in um, Nehemiah 1.5 that Nehemiah followed the Ten Commandments. So we see his character as part of this promise as well. And I think character does have something to do with favor. And we can run around the church all day long and have horrible character and maybe not get the same favor from God. Again, God still bestows his grace on sinners, but sometimes after walking with the Lord for a certain amount of time, he expects a certain level of maturity from us. This is also mirrored in Psalm 35. For the Lord is 
a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. Listen to this verse. No good thing does he withhold from them who walk uprightly. Okay. So you'd be like, well, where's my good thing? Are you walking uprightly? If you have asked God, where is my good thing? Are you walking uprightly? Now, sometimes there's Kairos moment. Sometimes there's Zima moments, you know, where it's like these, these divine moments that happen and you're waiting on your breakthrough and those kind of things. But there's also some times where you not walking uprightly with the Lord is really stopping your favor. Sometimes you just got to look in the mirror and say, what am I doing, Jesus? Number seven is that we love God. And I think not just from an intellectual sense, we love God. Yeah, I love God. Do you, like in an emotional sense, in a heart sense, do you love God? You got to ask yourself that question because it says he gives mercies to those that love him. Another tip we see with Nehemiah it was that he, and this is verse six, was that he was sin aware and repentant. We see that it says him and his father's house were sinning. So even though he was keeping the Ten Commandments, there was other things that he was doing outside of those things that were causing him to be in sin and his father's house to be in sin as well. And so I think there's levels of dealing with sin. I think the first one is sin awareness, awareing that we're sinners, aware. There's some people, I swear, like they are so, and this might sound mean, but they're just so unaware of their sin. Like they don't think they are sinning. Like they don't understand how could I sin? I'm a Christian. I'm like, well, that's, ri that's ridiculous. You know, that's absolutely ridiculous. That's a ridiculous theology. And often people caught up in that theology are very prideful and um, because they think they could not sin, you know? Even Paul says, you know, I do the wrong thing sometimes. Paul, the Apostle Paul says that. And so it's like, you think you're more holy than the Apostle Paul? Get out of here, just get out of here, okay? And so it's just a ridiculous theology. But being sin aware is one thing, being repentant is another thing. And so I would say that stage two, being aware is, is a good stage. That's a good stage to be at. Being repentant is an even better stage because we come before the Lord, we say, God, I've messed up. I've done X, Y, and Z thing. Please forgive me, you know, restore me, whatever you need to say to him, get it all out. Sin eradication is where the church needs to be, Jesus. And, you know, I heard um, Mike Bickle talk about this years ago. This was probably... God, I don't know, 13, 14 years ago, something like that. I was at this conference and I heard Mike Bickle talking about getting to this place of sin eradication. And I had never heard anyone use that phrase before. So I have to give him credit for that because I thought that was a really good phrase. But it's just like moving on from this place of repentance because that's like every, like, you know, sin awareness is step one, repentance is step two, sin eradication is step three where that sin is completely out of your life and never returns ever again. That's where the church needs to be. That's where the pure and spotless bride needs to be. We need to move from repentant to sin eradication. And because here's the thing, sometimes repentance is almost an excuse. Like, I know that sounds bad. It's like, oh God, I'm so sorry. Are you, are you really sorry if you just keep doing it again? Think about like a physical abuse victim, right? It's like, her husband punches her in the face, and I know some of you think that's sexist. Okay, so the wife punches the husband in the face, whatever. One spouse punches the other spouse in the face, right? And then it's like, then what happens after that? It's like, you say, I'm sorry, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I punched you in the face, like whatever. And then next week you punch them in the face again. Oh, I'm sorry. And then the next week you punch them in the face again. And at the end of six months, every week you have punched them in the face again. Are you really repentant? Are you really sorry? I believe there's a difference between repentance and sin eradication. And I believe as you move to that higher level of repentance, you're gonna see more breakthrough. And so it's not easy to move to those higher levels where you really say, I'm, I'm never gonna do this again. You know, where you say, I'm never gonna masturbate again. You know, and some of you think that's not a sin. Well, talk to the Lord about it. And um, where you really move to this place of saying, I'm never going to drink drunkenly ever again. You know, where you really move to this place of 
you know, I'm going to stop defiling my body. You know, I'm going to see it as a temple of God. You know, whatever it is for you, everyone's sin, this thing they struggle with is different. But it's just like, I think that the more we take out of our lives, the more we take out of our lives that are not God, the more we see favor and breakthrough in our lives because it's like, what is, what is that doing? It's basically getting demons going because as we enter into sin, we entertain demons. And so it's kind of like, because think about this simply. You're like, well, I, I wasn't entertaining demons. Yeah, what voice told you to do that? probably a demon. So you've just entertained that demon. So you have to understand that repentance frees you of certain demons. And the reason we're having a big deliverance revival right now, the reason all of us who are on the floors of ministry, you know, doing deliverance, it's like deliverance is just going on at every meeting in big ways. You know, I'm not even calling for deliverance and people are manifesting demons as soon as they come to the altar. Like I'm calling for like you know, maybe destiny, say something like that, you know, oh, come up here, get your breakthrough destiny. And demons are just manifesting on the altar because the thing is people are just given into so much sin because they just like can, they just keep and keep going on and on and they don't do er eradication. They just do sorry repentance. And so I believe the true meaning of repentance is to, is sin eradication when you get into like the Greek and Hebrew and stuff. But I, for our cultural sake, I think we have to say that we've almost used the word repentance too lightly, and we might have to start saying sin eradication because I think that's where we need to go. Jesus. All right, I can go on and on with that, so I'm going to go to the next one. Um, number nine, remember the promises of God. Nehemiah reminds the Lord of the promises that were spoken of the people of God. Now, I know this sounds weird because like God's not going to like forget or something like God's not like unaware of like the promises he spoke. God knows everything. So to think that God is just like, oh, I have no idea. I said that. Of course he said that. He's not some delusional person. Like he knows that he said that. But I think it increases our faith as we go before the Lord. And I also think it allows you to have conversations with the Lord about your promise and destiny and kind of helps you navigate coming out of something. And so I think a practical way that we could do this is to just keep the promises we feel like God has spoken over our lives somewhere where we can see them, um, somewhere where we review them regularly or something like that. Maybe you have a certain binder that you look at weekly or daily, or you have um, them on the wall, or you have them on the, you know, in your car somewhere, you have them in the mirror when you're getting ready for the day, like whatever, somewhere where you can see them is really important. And so I've noticed in my life when I can clearly see the promises from God, I will move so much more quickly towards them than when it's just like somewhere in a drawer somewhere. And so I try to be intentional about having it in a place that I can see it daily, Jesus. Um, number 10, he was specific. And this is in verse 111. He actually specifically asked for favor with the king from God. And so I think sometimes we're like, and wow, Nehemiah just got favor from the king. Wow, look what God did. It's like, um, he asked for that and God answered him. But I like that they kind of say that this was at the end of the chapter. It was kind of like right before we go into um, him having the moment. It's kind of like he did all these things first. He dealt with things first. And then he says, God, please prosper me this day and grant me favor with the king because he knew that the king could be the one that would give him what he needed. And we see that he was also prepared. This is an extra nugget. I wasn't going to say this, but this is an extra thing. But he was also prepared. And I think that's so interesting because it's like the king said, how long are you going to be gone? He was able to answer him. He said, what are you going to need? He was able to answer him. He was able to quickly tell him, I want the access to these certain places and things. And it was just like, he already knew if he got the opportunity to speak with the king, what he was going to say. You know, I used to work in the television industry. For those of you who are new to my channel, I used to be a television producer at many big corporations. Um, and being in television news was a very fast paced job. I mean, 30 seconds could change everything. It was really to live like that. It's absolutely hard and crazy. And for all of you still in the industry, God bless you. May God keep your strength in Jesus name. But it was a really hard industry to work in. 
but sometimes you you only had a minute or two to have a certain opportunity you know I've personally interviewed, you know, Governor Charlie Crist or former Governor Charlie Crist. Uh, you know, I interviewed Rudy Giuliani personally. I've interviewed Al Roker personally, you know, and some of these interviews I got, you might only have a few minutes to get the interview because these are busy people. These are not people that just sit down and talk with somebody like me. You know, maybe if you're on like a big television network, like, you know, you're sitting down on national NBC or something like that, maybe so, but like local stations sometimes, maybe not. And so you you might not always have like access to these people for very long and you need to know what you're gonna say, how you're gonna say it and whatever. And I had to be ready. Like I knew I'm gonna try to get, you know, this person to talk to me and I know what I'm gonna say to them because in five minutes they might be gone and the interview has been lost. But we have to understand that sometimes we have to be ready for the moment, Jesus. Sometimes we have to be ready for the moment. You're praying for God for a moment, but are you ready for it? If you met that person, what would you say and what would you do? If there was a certain person that could bring breakthrough to your life, what would you say to them and what would you do? I want you to think about that right now because maybe God's gonna open that door. You never know. And so start thinking about it. What would I say? What would I do? Because maybe God doesn't want to waste their time either. So maybe he's waiting for you to be ready to even talk to them because that person's also busy. Jesus, mm, God, look at it a different way. I just wanna pray for us before we go. I just pray right now for favor in our lives and that we would do what we need to do to get that favor. Whatever we have to get rid of in our hearts, whatever fast we need to go on, whatever thing we need to do, I just pray right now that we would do it. We would just do what needs to be done behind the scenes to get the favor because God wants to give us favor. God loves us. God wants to open doors for us. God is a good God. But what do we have to do behind the scenes to get those doors to open? Jesus. I just pray right now for your strength to do those things, whatever it is right now. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, give us the strength for breakthrough. Mm. And if you want to sow a favor seed into this ministry, you want to mark this moment and say, this is my moment where I'm gonna do all these things and my favor is coming. You want to sow a favor seed into this ministry, you can do that at knashministries.com. Just click on the giving tab. You can give through Cash App, knashmin, um, obviously, or you can send it to our mailing address as well, and I'll put that on the screen. Mm. If you're new to this channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure if you have a friend that needs favor or breakthrough, you share this with them so we can all walk into a new season. Hallelujah. All right, I love you guys and I'll talk to you in the next video. Bye guys.